Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. A technical analyst. I'm an old-fashioned credit guy, a fundamental guy. What this chart does is it gives you a visual illustration of the anatomy of gold bull markets going back 50 years. And I think that's very useful because although every market is different, there are broad characteristics that are similar. So the first thing that the chart shows you very obviously, and by the way, we'll talk about how your listeners can get hold of this chart later. But in the very beginning, the most instructive part of the chart is simply looking at the extraordinary cyclicality of precious metals equities. The beauty of this index is it's the longest running, most inclusive major gold equities index in existence. So you get a better sense of the present relative to history from this chart than any other tool that I'm aware of. And you will see within that cyclicality two broad themes that your listeners need to pay attention to. The first has been that there have been two prior gold bull markets in my career, one beginning in 1970 and ending in 1981 where the gold price itself, not the equities, which are more leveraged, but the gold price itself advanced from $35 an ounce to $850 an ounce. And remember that this bull market took 11 years. These are markets with both dimension and duration. The second bull market began, depending on how you look at the chart, in the year 2000. I would argue actually 1998, but that doesn't matter. That's semantics. And ended in 2011. Again, 11 years duration and amazing dimension. So the first illustration here for younger investors who haven't had the benefit or the pain of history, when people ask me, Rick, this bull market is already two years old. The gold price has already moved from $1,100 to $1,900. Have I missed the boat? Well, if past is prologue, no. The two prior gold bull markets lasted 11 years. And their dimension was astonishing. In the case of the more tepid of those gold bull markets, the gold price advanced from $252 an ounce to $1,900 an ounce. So if we are truly in a gold bull market, this chart gives you some sense of the expected duration dimension. The next thing I'd like to draw people's attention to has been the rallies from oversold bottoms, which is to say the volatility rather than the cyclicality. As I look at the chart, there have been eight and a half, looking at this one as half, not over yet, <laughs> recoveries from oversold bottoms. And these can occur in either gold bull markets or gold bear markets. And these are extraordinary. They aren't the decade-long cyclical features, but rather extraordinarily dramatic rally features, almost volatility. And their duration varies from as short as nine months to as long as 42 months. And amazingly, even in these rallies, which aren't typically bull markets, they can occur in bull or bear markets, the dimension of the rally is spectacular from 150% in a tepid market to six or 700% <laughs> in a hot rally. And by the way, it's important to remember too that this is the index. This isn't the best single stock in the index. This is the performance of the overall market with the most broadly inclusive equities index in the industry. The third thing, and you need to be able to blow up the chart on your computer to see this, is the incredible volatility within cyclicality. And this is the part that young people need to understand. Momentum followers, people who pay too much attention to technical analysis, run a huge, huge, huge risk of getting shaken out of this market. This is a market where the index, not the worst stock in the index, not some petty dreadful, 
but the overall index can fall by 15 or 20 percent or increase by 15 or 20 percent with the same ease with which you and I breathe. And so if you are going to play this game, if you are going to participate in the sector, it's difficult for me to understand why you wouldn't. You need to buckle your seatbelts for what will be an extraordinarily wild ride. It's interesting that many people view the market as a source of information. I regard it as a forum for buying and selling assets. If you derive information from the market, you forget that a market that has fallen 20% in price, if nothing has changed from the fundamentals, is precisely 20% more attractive than it was when it fell. So if you look at this chart and you understand the nature of cyclical bull markets and cyclical bear markets, and then you overlay the volatility, you will be much more prepared to invest or speculate your choice as to how to play the game wisely. Studying the chart and perhaps studying the chart in the context of the description I just gave is one of the most formidable tools that a young investor or a young speculator can use to understand the market and prepare himself or herself, both financially and psychologically, to prosper in a market that can be treacherous if you're not prepared. Absolutely, Rick. And you use that chart as a very instructive tool when you're reviewing people's portfolios that they can send in, correct? I do. And thank you for mentioning that. At the outset of this interview, I should say that I'll be making an offer at the end of the interview, giving people an incentive to get to know Sprott better. Specifically, I personally will review and rank everyone's resource stock portfolio if they wish. In addition to that, I will send every respondee the Barron's Gold Mining Index stock chart and an even more extraordinary stock chart, a 100-year commodity chart that shows relative commodity prices over 100 years relative to other financial assets and other classes of economic activity. All a respondee needs to do is go to a web link, sprotusa.com forward slash rankings. There, you will find a drop-down box where you enter in the name and symbols of your stocks, and we will respond with both the stock charts and, in fact, rankings. And as I say, it isn't important necessarily to look at this chart from the point of view of technical analysis, although there are some people who use it for that. It's much more useful as a visual illustration of the anatomies of bull markets and bear markets, that is to say, cyclicalities in precious metal stocks, and also the extraordinary volatility that you must expect if you're going to play this game. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more, Rick. So as you speak about the psychology of when the market goes down, it should actually become more attractive to you. And we think about where we are, let's say, in this precious metals bull market. What would cause you to change your mind that we're in a precious metals bull market right now? What would kind of signal to you, the change in your psychology in that? That's a wonderful question, and I'll try and answer it briefly, although that's difficult. There are five factors that cause me to believe that we are in a secular bull market in gold. Gold has moved over millennium for many reasons, mostly to do with fear, frankly. But it's important at the outset to remember that gold responds to both primary investment motivations, which is to say both greed and fear. It starts with fear. But when it moves, greed begins to take over. So let's look at the five factors. The most important fear that causes people to buy precious metals is fear of the degradation of the purchasing power of their savings in normal savings instruments. And around the world now, the world's reserve currency is the U.S. dollar. So fear of the efficacy of U.S. dollar savings is the most important driver, I believe, of the gold and gold equity prices. Let's look at the reasons for those fears. The first is quantitative easing, literally the debasement of the currency. If you and I did it, or you're a younger man, if you did it, if you started printing something called Palisades, (laughs) that would be called counterfeiting and you would be put in prison. (laughs) If the Fed and Congress do its policy, it's highly popular and they get Mm reelected. So quantitative easing by its nature, counterfeiting debases the currency. It does that. There's just no way around that. The second is related to the first, another form of debasement of the currency, which is to say debt and deficits. 
and I'm speaking to an American audience because the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, not trying to be ethnocentric. But in the U.S., at the federal level, we recently, by last week, went through $27 trillion on balance sheet recourse liabilities at the federal level. It doesn't include state and local debts, and it doesn't include underfunded pension funds. It's just the uh, on balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. federal government. Probably more concerning, the Congressional Budget Office now estimates that the off-balance sheet liabilities of the U.S. federal government, (laughs) that's old folks like me, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all these kind of things, exceed $150 trillion. So we're somewhere around $180 trillion in recourse obligations, net present value of recourse obligations at the federal level. We service this debt, of course, with the national income, which is taxes and fees, less expenses. The problem with that is that that number is in deficit. In the month of July alone, we increased the net federal debt. That is to say, the deficit increased by $850 billion. Even Warren Buffett, hardly a gold bug, suggests that the federal debt will never be paid off. It'll be rolled. That means two things. It means that the credit quality of the issuer, which is to say the U.S. federal government, gets worse and worse and worse and should demand a higher risk premium. (laughs) And it tells you, too, that debt and deficits are an almost permanent structural part of the U.S. economy, which is a scary thing with regards to U.S. dollar denominated savings and a good thing with regards to gold. The most important determinant is number three, which is real interest rates. Interest is the payment that savers receive for foregoing consumption. If you consume something five years from now, rather than consuming it now, you let somebody else consume now, they pay you rent on their capital. But interest is more than that. Interest is also the risk premium that you receive for the credit quality. It should vary according to the debt servicing capabilities of the issuer. And it's your compensation for time value of money. Negative interest rates on savings are not, as Buffett says, a state of nature. They're a contrived state. The idea that you should pay somebody to borrow your money and take risk with it, as opposed to be paid, is absolutely silly. And if there's anything at all that should undermine your confidence in U.S. dollar denominated savings, it's negative interest rates. The world's benchmark security, at least when I was in business school, admittedly a long time ago, but throughout my career, has been the U.S. 10-year treasury. It's the world's benchmark security. It's the one that everything else is priced against, even the petty dreadful gold stocks, ultimately. So the U.S. 10-year treasury pays an interest rate right now of about 60 basis points, six-tenths of 1%, in a currency that's deteriorating by conservative estimates at 1.6% a year. What that means is that if you save in the U.S. 10-year treasury, you are guaranteed to lose at least 1% a year in purchasing power. My friend Jim Grant calls this return-free risk. Gold is competing with return-free risk in a negative interest rate environment, a fight gold can win. The fourth factor is that gold and precious metals-related securities are under-owned in society. It has been estimated by a major U.S. bank that precious metals and precious metals-related assets comprise one-half of 1%, one-half of 1% of total savings and investment products in the United States. To put it in context, that's down from a three-decade mean of 1.5% to 2%. So if we just had mean reversion as a consequence of negative interest rates, debt and deficits, and currency debasement, Demand for precious metals and precious metals assets would either triple or quadruple, depending on your measurement technique. Then the fifth is really interesting. This was pointed out to me by my partner, John Hathaway. Institutional investors worldwide now control about $100 trillion in assets. And traditionally, the institutional matrix has been 60% equity, 40% debt. But in a negative interest rate environment, you can't hold that much debt. Debt with a negative interest has a negative carry. Traditionally, institutional investors found 
that when the economy faltered and stock prices fell, interest rates fell. And so the capitalized value of a bond increased with falling interest rates. But they can't fall too far below zero. Meanwhile, you have a negative carry. So your option premium, in effect, goes up. And in a circumstance like this, one could foresee major disintermediation among institutional investors with $40 trillion worth of bond holdings into other hedges. Throughout history, the primary hedge, of course, has been gold. So for those five reasons, I believe we're in a gold market. Now, to finally, after this long-winded response, give you your answer, what would cause me to think that this was over? A reversal of these trends. If quantitative easing, which is to say counterfeiting, was to end, if the debasement of the currency was to end, if the structural deficit in the U.S. economy became less than 1% of GDP, which is to say if the debt and deficit were growing at a rate slower than the economy was growing, most importantly, if the interest rates in the United States on U.S. Treasury securities had their historical real yield, which is about 250 basis points. So if the yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury was at 5% with the rate of depreciation at 1.6%, you know, then you would logically switch the money from gold in the U.S. 10-year Treasuries. If the market share of precious metals and precious metals-related assets in the United States went substantially above the median and the mean, then you would say that gold was no longer under-owned. So there are a bunch of statistical parameters that you can put in place that are fairly simple. And while they're not wholly accurate, nothing in the world is wholly accurate. The warning signs would be a balanced budget, <laughs> positive real interest rates, and the end of counterfeiting. My own belief is that we're in a political and social trap in the United States that suggests that it will be a fairly long time before we face the type of reckoning in the economy that we faced as an example in 1982, when Volcker raised the interest rate so dramatically, broke the back of inflation, and set the economy on the path of growth. It would seem, you know, throughout my career, every sort of eight years, we'd go through a sort of a cyclical recession. It would seem that Congress has decided now that recessions are illegal. And it seems that they're going to try and manage our way out of these recessions with this insane money printing and debasement of the currency. When that comes to an end, if it comes to an end, there will need to be other asset classes that we look at. But I don't see that happening for a while. And the 50-year Barron's Gold Mining Index chart, in conjunction with the um, fundamentals with regards to gold, I would suggest bears me out. These bull markets in precious metals and precious metals-related equities historically have had both dimension and duration. Excellent, Rick. So how does sentiment in a certain commodity sector really inform your investing strategy? And talk to us a little bit about, you know, interest in the sector versus, let's say, market cap. Well, I view sentiment as a negative. <laughs> you know, the truth is, even an old timer like me, who shouldn't have sentiment, does and it's extremely dangerous. We regard ourselves as dispassionate fact seekers, taking information from all sides of the world, processing it rationally, and making logical conclusions. In young people's parlance, that's bullshit. <laughs> what we do is we absorb information that's comfortable to us, that supports our existing paradigms and prejudices. That's why bull markets go to illogical extremes and bear markets do too. And we have recency bias, which is to say our most recent experiences weigh more heavily on us than history does. So we tend to ignore both volatility and cyclicality. But the most dangerous thing that we do is we conflate price and value. When somebody says XYZ mining company is worth $2 a share, what they mean is that it's selling for $2 a share. The easiest information to obtain is price information. Probably the least important information that you can obtain is price information, too, because price is of no use if you don't understand value. It's the discrepancy between price and value, or more importantly, the discrepancy between price and your estimation of future values that matter. Now, strangely, financial assets are the only assets that people tend to be more attracted to when they're overpriced. Mm -hmm. 
If you were searching for a suit of clothes and you found a suitable suit of clothes at a merchant that you trusted and was selling for a thousand bucks, if you bought it and went back two months later wanting another suit and it was for sale for $2,000, you'd be irate. You'd be furious. But if you bought a gold stock for a dollar and you went back two months later and it was for sale for $2, you'd be elated. The truth is that if the underlying value of a company hasn't increased, but the share price has doubled, it is arithmetically precisely half as attractive. Mm -hmm. And most investors get that wrong. The fact that the price has gone up reinforces the narrative around the stock and causes people to believe the narrative more completely and average up. And that's probably the cause of more investor loss than any other single character flaw in the market. The focus on price to the exclusion of value and the understanding that the entry price of an opportunity is one of the most important determinants of the uh, sort of ultimate reward we seek. For myself, I'm old enough now that volatility works for me. I have a shopping list of assets that I'd like to buy, and I have target prices, always wrong, by the way, <laughs> but my sort of exit plan for these stocks, and that determines my entry. So in circumstances where the market falls by 20 or so percent, it's attractive to me. The truth is, from my point of view, I have about 45 stocks on my focus list. And given that I have fairly high price targets, most of them aren't for sale now. It's in my interest to see those stocks lower so I can buy more, mm -hmm. not higher in the near term, because I believe that we're in a bull market and I believe I'm going to sell them substantially higher. If I have a $5 stock that I ultimately believe three years or four years from now is going to be a $20 stock. I would much rather see that stock at $3.50 rather than see it at $6.50 or $7 because I'm not going to sell it for $6.50 or $7. But at $3.50 down from $5, if I think it's going to $15 or $20, I'd buy the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. And it's that sort of rational analysis of sentiment and markets that more people need to absorb. So Rick, as you're speaking about, if we go into another correction, like we saw in March, on one hand, let's look at it and I'll ask you, what types of companies do you like to own to kind of hedge that risk, to protect that value, A, and B, how much cash do you like to be sitting on currently? And are you looking for another low entry point before this bull market really takes off again? I currently have way too much cash. Because the junior market went so far so fast that I was forced to do some selling. You know, I had some companies that I thought were reasonably on an opportunistic basis worth an 80 million market cap. And when they hit 120, 130 million dollars, <laughs> you know, I had to sell. I just had to sell. So I would say that my managed accounts are approaching 40% cash. This isn't strategic, it's tactical. Mm -hmm because the area where I believe I have durable competitive advantage is in the sub billion dollar market cap. And the area that I believe I have durable competitive advantage in across the length and breadth, not every stock, but across the length and breadth is overpriced. So that's a challenge for me. For investors that don't have access to the research capabilities of Sprott, that is to say speculators that don't have geologists, engineers, financial analysts, and all those people working for them like me, all these wonderful crutches that an old man has. <laughs> the investors need to err on the side of quality. Mm -hmm. The penny dreadful, you know, the, the micro cap stock is, of course, intoxicating because everybody wants a hundred to one shot. But what you'll learn looking at that uh, Barron's gold mining index is that the equity indexes themselves over five years can escalate 600%, 700%, meaning that you put $100,000 up and you walk out with six or $700,000 or, if you're lucky, a million dollars. For most investors, you need to emphasize quality and obtaining the market data. The idea that you take substantial risk to outperform an index that could give you seven or 800% is on the face of it stupid. Most investors would be better off underperforming the index a little bit because there's too many lousy stocks in it. 
owning the five or six best stocks in the world and de-risking the 800% rather than trying to get 900% by increasing their risk of absolute failure with junk stocks. That doesn't mean don't speculate. All of the money that this old man now invests wisely, he got it by speculating wildly. But to the extent that you speculate, understand that you must use money that you both can afford to lose a substantial part of and where you are willing to work very, very, very hard. You can buy the five or six best gold stocks in the world and then relax. You can go fishing as long as debt and deficits, quantitative easing and negative interest rates are in place. All you have to do with the best gold stocks in the world is read a book, play with your kids and go fishing. Mm -hmm. But if you own the small stocks where I made the money that I (laughs) now invest so sagely, (laughs) that's very different. You need to spend, I would suggest, at least one hour per month on every speculative stock in your portfolio. You need to read the annual reports. You need to read the proxies to find out if the executives are cheating you. You need to look at the assumptions that go into the 43101. Are they using a $1,200 gold price or $1,900 gold price? Mm -hmm. You need to do the work. If you own 20 speculative stocks in your portfolio, you need to spend 20 hours a month on those stocks. Mm -hmm. And if you can't afford 20 hours, you can't afford 20 stocks. Very important that people understand that. So, Rick, can I ask, how did you determine the time to sell any of your juniors that you say you've capitalized on? And as a result, you have too much cash right now. Are there some metrics that you use to indicate that? Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Whenever I buy a stock, a speculative stock in particular, I buy it because I believe that there's a catalyst in place. I believe that there's a possibility that they will answer some unanswered question, Mm -hmm. which will increase the value as opposed necessarily to the price of a stock. So let's say that there's a penny dreadful exploration stock that is in a good terrain. It has people that I know and love and trust. They have a nice surface anomaly and they're preparing to drill it. The unanswered question then becomes, does the surface anomaly extend into the third dimension at depth? Can they build tons? Mm -hmm. And let's say that I assume, not knowing, but I assume that there is because of the length and width of the surface anomaly, I think that there's a 60% chance that it extends at depth. And I think if they answer the unanswered question that in a stable to rising gold price environment, that should double the stock. Just as an example, Mm -hmm. right? In a market like we were just in and are probably still in, sometimes the anticipation of the result gives you the price action that you had expected after you had the result. Mm -hmm. which is to say that the stock doubles or triples before you have the information that would be required to justify that valuation. In that circumstance, I always sell half my stock. When I get the result I was looking for, before I get the information that would justify the result, I always sell enough of the stock that I have my bait back. I call that the point of no concern Mm -hmm. to differentiate it from losing money, which is the point of no return. (laughs) In a circumstance where I get the result, but the market response isn't as robust as I had thought it would be, I certainly buy more. Mm -hmm. If I believe that the answer to the unanswered question is yes, but the market doesn't respond, that's my favorite of all circumstances. Mm -hmm. Then I go to war and buy lots and lots and lots of (laughs) stuff. If I get the result that I was looking for, in other words, if the unanswered question comes back, yes, and the market price responds, then what I have to do is repeat the process. Mm -hmm. What's the next unanswered question? What's the probability of success? And what's the likely outcome? In exploration speculation, of course, the most common result has been that the answer isn't yes, it's no. You know, because exploration is a risky game. Normally, the data that you get back doesn't justify a higher share price. And in those circumstances, depending on how far the miss was, you sell the stock. If you're down 20%, you sell a stock. 30%, you sell a stock. 40%, you sell a stock. You avoid going to zero. You avoid the catastrophic loss. So in my circumstances, particularly with my small silver stocks, Mm -hmm. the market developed a fondness for silver that outstripped the data that was available to value those holdings. Now, I need to say that my valuation criterion are strict 
my former partner and very good friend, Eric Sprott, has an opinion as to the silver price. I have an opinion, too. Mm -hmm. Opinion is more aggressive than mine. And he is willing to take more risk based on his opinion of the silver price than I am. For me, my opinion of the silver price in the future is the strip, the futures market for silver, which is what I use to value silver stocks. So you can have a circumstance where two fairly sophisticated investors, Eric Sprott and Rick Rule, are on different sides of the trade. Me, because the net present value according to the forward strip is way lower than the market capitalization. And Eric, because the market capitalization is lower than his expected net present value as a consequence of the way he sees silver prices. So do you think we can get your conservative estimate for the price of silver? Um, you know, I don't want to say it because the SEC says that, that constitutes investment advice. Mm -hmm. Any of your listeners who want to can look at the forward strip, look at the futures prices for silver two years out. And that's what I use. For 50 years or so of trying to do commodities price forecasting mm -hmm. and also slavishly looking at the work of other people doing commodities price forecasting, what I've learned is that every guru in the world has a commodity price forecast unblemished by success. They're all consistently wrong. And so what I've decided, rather than humble myself continually mm -hmm. or listen to other discredited analysts is decide that the best forecast is not one that was published to sell stock, but rather one, which is to say the strip, that people have written checks to support their thesis on. It doesn't mean that it's right. It just means that the information and the motivation that went into constructing that model is the fairest and the best in the world. Absolutely, Rick. That's a great way to put it, and I appreciate that answer. You also speak about how George Soros bets against broadly held premises that are wrong. So could you give us a couple examples of this? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Right now we're in the midst of the damnedest one I think I've ever seen in my life. Bonds have been in a bull market since 1982. Everybody wants to buy the dip. In 1982, if my memory is correct, the nominal yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury was 15.6. The nominal yield now leaves out the 15. It's 0.6. A 38-year bond bull market, if it isn't over, is much closer to the ending than to the beginning. Mm -hmm. Because owning long-duration bonds guarantees you a loss. And at some point in time, the prospect of a guaranteed loss won't be attractive to people. The broadly held premise, however, is that bonds are good. Mm -hmm that one buys the dips, that bonds shield you from volatility. If you go back to the decade that existed before 1982, which is, say, the decade of the 70s, when market interest rates rose, bonds were regarded by Hayek as certificates of guaranteed confiscation. So I would suggest that after 38 years, the bond bull market, especially the long duration bond bull market, is over. The most broadly held premise right now is that in terms of volatility, bonds are the place to be. I think that's a wonderful premise that's wrong. Another premise that's wrong is what I would describe as the Greta premise, which is to say the end of carbon energy. Mm -hmm. It will surprise people to know that the year that had the greatest consumption of coal in recorded human history was 2019. <laughs> and oil and gas too. The idea that Consumption of carbon energy is over is insane. Mm -hmm. The rate of growth will slow, but carbon fuels are one of the most efficient generators of power on the planet. My own estimation is that the year of peak consumption for oil and gas worldwide will be 2035. And yet wealthy Western people have this perception that poor folks in Zambia or Bangladesh are all going to be driving Teslas. Mm -hmm ain't going to happen. The dichotomy in value between nascent battery manufacturers that don't have a plant and ExxonMobil is absolutely silly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wild. I'm not saying that we're going to go into an oil and gas bull market soon, 
But the truth is that we're going to, at some point in time, have a price recovery in oil and gas that will take your face off. Will we need alternative energy? Of course, we'll need all forms of energy. There's 7.7 billion of us on Earth. One billion currently don't have access to electricity. The electrification of the world, the further electrification of the way that you and I live, the energy intensive nature of the ascent of man means that are we going to need coal? Yes. Wind? Yes. Solar? Yes. Oil? Yes. Nuclear? Yes. The answer is all of the above. The narrative, however, the World Economic Forum, that noted physicist Greta Thornburg, <laughs> Joe Biden, AOC, the idea that we've entered into a post-industrial or post-carbon economy forgets the fact that the two billion people at the bottom of the demographic pyramid worldwide want to live like AOC and Greta do. Mm -hmm. They have a right to live that way. And increasingly, they have the means. So I think that's a widely held premise that's silly. Mm -hmm. The last widely held premise, I think, unfortunately, is going to get more widely held, which is to say that collective solutions are good for you. The faith in government to solve problems, I think, is probably the biggest falsely held premise. And one, by the way, that Mr. Soros holds dear to his heart. Mm -hmm. You know, side note, he believes that government should listen to him, in which case he would think that they were good. I would argue that the advances in living standards that we've seen worldwide have been the function of individual creativity and initiative and the function of savings rather than spending. I believe that the United States is a classic example of individual creativity and initiative generating so much wealth that we've been able to afford our collective stupidity. Mm -hmm. Now, the first two widely held premises, the ones, you know, with regards to the bond bull market and the ones with regards to energy, I think are going to crack yielding spectacular profits to people who bet against them. Unfortunately, I think the third one is continuing to increase in popularity and I think generates real risks to people, particularly people of your age, mm -hmm. people who are taught that there are collective solutions. You know how earlier in this discussion, we talked about the off balance sheet liabilities of the US government, the $150 trillion. That's really an income transfer from your generation to mine. Mm -hmm. And ironically, well, I think it's fairly amusing. You know, I, in my life, my generation has voted ourselves all this cool stuff, all these cool subsidies, and we're giving you all the bill. The ironic part about it is that your generation is encouraging us to do more. Mm -hmm. And you're going to be stuck with the tab. You're going to have either a substantially lower living standard or a bunch of those obligations are going to go to money heaven. Mm -hmm. The political and social response among your generation and mine is to pretend and extend, kick the can down the road. And that's very, very, very dangerous, I think. I couldn't agree more, Rick. One thing I'd like to touch on was more related to the energy and the oil side of the equation that you were highlighting just then. So I know for the last, let's say, five to six years, you've been saying that we need to just see another good 18 months for uranium to recover. So Give us your thoughts on where we are in that picture. And if, you know, we saw the mine closures, we saw all of the, you know, the absolute amazing fundamentals supposedly come down the pipe for uranium, but we really haven't seen it move much. So the market is tighter, but the economic circumstance is less permissive. Mm -hmm. What I said all along is that the near term uranium price will be a function of the pace of Japanese restarts. Right. And that's unchanged. Mm -hmm. Now, the truth is that I am nervous about the state of the global economy, which means I'm nervous in the near term about the strength of the Japanese export economy, which means I'm nervous in the near term about electrical consumption in Japan and low energy prices lower the cost of liquefied natural gas, which is what the Japanese have used as a substitute energy source for uranium. So in the near term, I'm still bearish about uranium prices, wholly mm -hmm. as a function of Japan. 
What's happened, however, is that total uranium consumption worldwide as a consequence of Chinese plant construction is now higher than it was before Fukushima. Mm -hmm. So we have a circumstance where there is still surplus inventory, most of it held in Japan. Mm -hmm. The market views that inventory as held for sale because the Japanese aren't using it as inventory for fuel. We will reach a tipping point at some point in time because we're involved now in a huge structural deficit with regards to current consumption. When that happens, no one knows. With regards to investable uranium companies, which is high quality uranium companies, I can't name them apparently, but there are three. I'll give people a hint. I think the time to buy them is now. Mm -hmm. They're cheap. They have a yield, so you cover time value of money. With regards to the speculative ones, there's about 25 in the world. We think nine or 10 are viable, mm -hmm. which is extraordinary. What that means is that 40% of the universe, the speculative universe, is viable. I would say in the gold junior universe, the number is no more than 10 or 15%. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that you need to run out and buy them because if it takes another 12 to 18 months, most of them will need to return to market to raise fresh capital to survive. And so to the extent that your listening audience has the ability to participate in private placements or buy right after the private placement, after the company's continued existence is secure, mm -hmm. that's the right strategy in that sector. I don't think that true speculators and resources have any justification for ignoring the opportunity. Because in my experience, when a sector has the same upside that uranium does, and has the same de minimis market capitalization that uranium does, as Doug Casey famously said, when the investor appetite returns, there isn't enough market capitalization to hold the capital that comes in. Mm -hmm. He describes it as attempting to siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. <laughs> A little history is probably instructive for your younger listeners. The um, last uranium bull market, 1999 to 2006, at the beginning of that cycle, there were only five juniors in the uranium space worldwide, people who had survived a 20-year bear market. Mm -hmm. The poorest performing of those five companies increased in price by 22 times, not percent, mm -hmm. 22 times in six years. The best went up 10 thousand percent. By the way, we're down to now 25 juniors uh, mm -hmm. as an example. At the height of that market, it went from five companies to 500 companies, which tells you the illogical extreme that bull markets go to. This is instructive for many reasons. The first is that the market capitalization is again de minimis. The second is more subtle. There is a class of investor in the world that's still active who remembers the last bull market. And I suspect that when you give that class of investors a whiff of hope, that the response in the juniors, because they remember 22 to 1, 50 mm -hmm. to 1, 100 to 1, 10,000 to 1, the front running of that market, the anticipation of that market relative to the market cap means that you will get a fairly explosive response before that market is validated. If you look back to 2016, the price of uranium increased from suicidal to unsustainable. The industry was still not viable, but the increase in the uranium price from suicidal to unsustainable generated a 300% response in the junior uranium index. That tells you something about mm -hmm. the responsiveness of this market. Now, this isn't a market for people that can't take volatility. And it isn't a market for people who can't afford psychologically to hold stock over a long weekend. This is for a logical, rational, well-capitalized and stable speculator. And those caveats may have disqualified most people. Mm -hmm. So, Rick, in doing some research for this interview today, I came across you talking about the fact that we're enjoying a bull market right now. And as you, let's say, come to the close of your career, that we're going to enjoy another bull market in three to five years. So could you clarify the markets that you mean in that, please? Yeah, this is a speculative thesis. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but it's the way I'm planning. I believe that we are in the middle of the early stage of a precious metals bull market. I think that we're sort of three years into a market that'll run 10 or 11 years. Mm -hmm. And I think the gold price goes higher. 
the silver price goes higher and the quality gold and silver equities prices goes much higher. And I think that this market continues for somewhere between two and five years. And when it ends, will be answered by the statistical questions that we talked about earlier. But then I think we're going to have a stealth bull market, which is where people will really make money. Mm -hmm. I believe that the global economy is going to be soft for the next three or four years, which means that the copper price is going to be soft. The uranium price could be soft. The oil price will be soft. The zinc price will be soft. The nickel price will be soft. And what will happen then will be a continuation of the trends that we've seen for the last nine years, which is an underinvestment on a global basis in productive capacity in those materials. In other words, you'll balance supply and demand, not by increasing demand, which mm -hmm. requires a good economy, but rather by decreasing supply. And when you balance supply and demand by decreasing supply in capital intensive cyclical industries, what happens is that when the pricing signals begin to recover, the industry can't increase supply fast enough to service demand. And so you get these price spikes. That's what happened in the year 2000. We had underinvested in productive capacity in, in resources through the decade of the 80s and 90s. For 20 years, we underinvested. And as emerging markets demand, particularly Chinese demand, began to play on the market, because we'd underinvested for 20 years, we didn't have the ability in the near term to increase supplies. And so you saw the natural gas price go from a buck to 15 bucks. You saw the oil price go from 15 bucks to 120 bucks. You saw the copper price go from 75 cents to $4.50. My thesis has been that we have underinvested in productive capacity for industrial materials in the economy since really 2011. And if we do it for two or three more years, we will have structural deficits in oil and gas, structural deficits in copper, certainly in uranium and nickel and zinc, and that we'll get the type of price responses four years from now, five years from now, that we got in 2000. Really a truly rip your face off rally. Mm -hmm. Now, from my point of view at age 67, clearly past my sell by date, although active, my suspicion is that I get to look smart in the gold market for two, three, four years. And then I get to look really smart in years, I don't know, four, five, six, seven. So my suspicion is that I get to go out of my career with the wind in my sails for seven years, experiencing two bull markets, harvesting some gains, certainly in the gold equities, when everybody wants to be in them, recycling those gains in the anti-Greta trade. And then who knows what happens? after all that's over. So as you always say, the cure for low prices is low prices, right? That's right. So Rick, as you really show us, you have the advantage of time and you've certainly learned a lot through your career. And I think that that's super valuable. And that's why investors my age need to learn from guys like you. So one thing I would really like to ask you is how do you go about testing your own assumptions and taking into account your own prejudices? Every time I buy a stock, I write down why. I write down what could go right, and I write down what could go wrong. Mm -hmm. And then I try and re-examine that thesis every 90 days. And where I make mistakes, which is, of course, common, I try and examine the nature of the mistake. On my broad theses, too, I try and set statistical parameters. I'm never right. I just need to be more right than the other guy. Mm -hmm. And I need to test my thesis. My gold thesis, well, I gave you my gold thesis. And so I have statistical parameters which will cause me to revisit the thesis. If the things that I believe are responsible for making the gold price go up change, then my view of the market needs to change. The consequence of that rational approach is that I am always early buying, always. And I'm always early selling, always. Mm -hmm. which means that the more aggressive speculator usually outperforms me in a bull market and then gets his or her ass handed to them <laughs> at the end of it. Yeah. And I, you know, I have no need of repeating the exercise that I experienced in my 20s, mm -hmm. where I went from being a very wealthy young man to having a negative net worth. Mm -hmm. The idea that I take a nice big fat slug out of the middle is fairly attractive. And duration is something else. It's odd that at age 67, with less time on earth, I've become more patient. Mm -hmm. I've now been through, what, 10, five-year cycles? 
in my investing career. Mm-hmm. Five years doesn't seem like a long time to me. When I talk to someone in their 20s, ironically, when they have much more time left on earth, they're substantially less patient than I am, mm-hmm. which is probably one of the only reasons in the world why I can outcompete them. My expectations are rational and theirs are silly. Mm-hmm. So as you've seen all these different cycles and you find them very instructive, if you could give us a couple other forms of instruction, I know you speak a lot about the Ben Graham book, The Intelligent Investor. Do you think you could give us a couple more that have really proven valuable to you? I love to give book recommendations. I think the most important investment you can make is in yourself. Mm-hmm. So, you st- well, you don't actually start with The Intelligent Investor. The place that you start is economically one lesson by Hazlitt. Mm -hmm. so that you understand how the broad economy works. This is the best economics book ever written relative to the effort required to read it. Mm -hmm. And it frees you from all the idiocy of the economics that people are taught in university. So you start with economics in one lesson by Hazlitt. It's a skinny book, well worth the read. You go from there to Ben Graham, The Intelligent Investor, Mm -hmm. which is similarly the best investment book ever written relative to the effort to read it, particularly Margin of Safety, and Mr. Market. Those are the two parts. Well, no, though, I shouldn't say that. The whole book is really, really, really worth reading. If you are then interested and you like what you're doing and intend to have investments as an important part of your life, you need to read securities analysis. And it is not easy reading. Mm -hmm. It is hard reading. But if you read securities analysis and you employ the lessons in securities analysis, you will, without fail, become rich. You will do it, but it's difficult to employ that. You have to have your brain override your heart, Mm -hmm. which is a very difficult thing to do. Then the final book of the final four, the most important book I ever read, was Human Action by Ludwig von Mises, where it talks about volition, human will, human motivation, understanding how individuals work and how collectives of individuals called societies work, and understanding how volition drives government action, individual action, and economic action. And that book is hellacious. It was written in turgid German and then translated awkwardly into English. After you've done that, the next book that one would read would probably be Seth Klarman's book, Margin of Safety, which takes one of Ben Graham's lessons and teaches you after you have some money how you avoid investment risk sort of entirely Mm -hmm. for the duration of your career. It doesn't teach you as much about making money as how to avoid losing it so that you can enjoy the power of compounding over your career. I've probably caused tens of thousands of books to be bought in my career. And unfortunately, I talk to people afterwards and they think that somehow buying the books gives them access to the knowledge. That's wrong. You have to read them. (laughs) And you have to employ the lessons learned in your own actions. Mm -hmm. Some sage advice there, Rick. Give us again the best place to find you and the offer that you're going to provide. We'll also put the link in the show notes, but the offer to review anybody's resource portfolio. Great. Yeah. I find the best form of education that I can give people is personal, talking about their own portfolio. They seem to absorb that better. (laughs) So go to a web link, sproutusa.com forward slash rankings. Enter your natural resource portfolio, not your supermarket stocks, not your banks. (laughs) And I will rank them one to 10, one being best, 10 being worst. I will also comment briefly on stocks where I think that you know, my comments might have value. And I'll send it back to you. No obligations. I will also send you, if you ask, just say charts. I will send you the Barron's Gold Mining Index, and I will send you the 100-year Commodity Index. I'll send it back by return email. I look forward to that. I found that the easiest way to impart investing lessons is to talk to people about their own portfolios. It's worth knowing that this isn't investment advice because I don't know your listeners individually. I'm ranking the companies. I'm not ranking.